Welcome everyone. This is our first virtual uh, lecture at the MIT Water Club. Um, so the MIT Water Club, as most of you uh, already know, is a student-led organization which uh, brings together students, researchers, and almost everybody across the different schools and departments of the MIT who has a general interest in water um, and try to develop a network and promote uh, water-related research uh, and innovation across the MIT and locally. So most of our big summer events uh, have been postponed due to the COVID-19 pandemic, but uh, we are trying to organize virtual smaller events in order to um, uh, keep our community connected. Uh, so at this moment, I will uh, pass the, the floor to, to Anselmo to in, and, and Karen to introduce uh, our today's uh, lecturers. Go ahead, yes. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the MIT Water Monthly Lectury. My name is Anselmo Cassiano. Yeah. I'm the chairman of the lecture series. Today, we, we are pleased to welcome Jack Rowe, director of the NFL Environment Program. But first, I want to say thank you to our president, Patricia and Andrew, our vice president, Grace Connors, and Dr. Karen Weber, Director of Foundation for a Green Future, and our lovely Vice President of MIT Postdoctor Association, Dr. Christina Florea. All these people are instrumental in making these events happen today to celebrate the end of the semester. I met Jack last year, and I was very impressed with his speech. Dynamically presents, I learned how events that impact more than 100 million people can be considered sustainable. Jack Grohl is a principal in the consult firm U.S. Green Sport. Mr. Grohl has been a communication and environment consultant for more than 27 years and has worked on Super Bowl since 1993. He has been called the father of American sports sustainability. And under his leadership, Super Bowl, the NFL annual championship game has become recognized as the greenest professional sport championship in America. Uh, today, he'll talk about sustainability for mega events, the Super Bowl experience. Before he starts, I want to ask Karen Webb to introduce his wife, Susan. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Nice to be here. And thank you um, to Cassiano and the MIT Water Club for hosting Jack and Susan Grow and bring everyone together. Susan's the other uh, dynamic part of the duo. Everything that they, I believe they do a lot of work on these projects together, but it looks like Susan comes from a background of journalism and being a TV reporter at one point. And uh, she is the president of Grow Associates and a founder of their consulting firm, US Green Sports. So I, she has been uh, very, um, involved in initiating community partnerships that go into making some of the innovative aspects of the NFL environmental program as exciting as they are. Uh, you'll find out how the NFL goes to a community and make, leaves it greener when they, when, they, them, when they get there, it's greener when they leave. So um, she helps establish community partnerships with the schools, with nonprofits, with community organizations. They help repurpose materials. They help distribute food that might not have um, been able to be used and make sure that people um, get it who will use it. They help make sure that schools, school children that are deserving uh, get books and sports equipment and school supplies. So, and the list just goes on. I'll let them go ahead and, and talk, but we're thrilled to have both Jack and Sue here. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, th thanks very much, Karen. And, and uh, before we start off here, too, I just want to do one really quick introduction. I just noticed that uh, our colleague David Crawford has uh, logged on with us here. David was an executive with the uh, uh, Vancouver Olympics and uh, also is a key member of our uh, green team uh, from, from all across the nation that we assemble each year to work on some of these projects. Uh, David's headquartered out of Vancouver and uh, works with the Board of Trade uh, there. So uh, 
uh, he's on there. I don't see his picture, so that may mean he's still in his pajamas out in Vancouver. <laughs> and David, that's fine if that's uh, if, if, if that's if that's where you're at this morning. That's absolutely fine. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, yeah. So we'll we'll just launch into our uh, presentation here a bit. As uh, as uh, uh, Cassiano said, uh, my name is Jack Grove. I've been with the NFL now for 28 years uh, as uh, environmental uh, program director. Uh, and the NFL began at Super Bowl 28 in 1993. We were the first uh, professional sports organization to ever look at the environmental impact of what large mega events uh, have. And uh, we also were the beginning of the sports sustainability movement uh, in America. So we're very proud of that uh, accomplishment. And I think it, it, it uh, talks about the, uh, it, it speaks to us about the vision that the uh, National Football League has had, even for those who aren't football fans. It still has, has made a, a huge impact uh, across the country. And I'm Susan Grove. Thank you, Karen, for the wonderful introduction. But Jack and I are both involved in every aspect of this program, in everything from developing the program from the start to the planning, the budgeting, implementing the projects. Uh, and it's a lot of fun, a lot of fun to work together on this. So we'll go ahead and launch into um, what we do, and then we'll have uh, time at the end for questions. All right, let me put up, uh, we're, we're going to uh, do some screen sharing here, and we tested this out, so it should work uh, pretty well. Let me put this up. We'll hop back and forth here just a little bit. Um, is that uh, screen share is up, right, Karen? Okay, good. All right. So let us move ahead just a bit here. This was our mission statement in 1993 to incorporate environmental principles consistent with sound business practices. We've never found any reason actually to change or to update that. And we, and we, we think it's, it, it's pretty remarkable that a mission statement that's 28 years old still seems to hold despite all the changes that we've had. This is our bottom line, um, you, you know, not only to, to uh, implement environmental principles, but it has to make sense. It has to make sense based on the NFL's uh, business model, because without that, the, the programs themselves are not sustainable. Uh, if, if the folks on our business end uh, can't support them, they're not going to continue uh, very long. Here's a little look at our uh, history in brief. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll start it off here and then Susan can jump in. Uh, we began in 1993. Our first project was solid waste recycling. And by the way, I, I, I don't know if Karen or, or Patricia or, or uh, Cassie mentioned this, but if you do have questions, please jot them down because Susan and I are going to kind of zip through things pretty quickly. Uh, and, and, you know, we want to make sure if questions pop up while we're doing this, uh, that you get a chance to, uh, uh, to fire those at us at the end of the presentation. We will leave time. So solid waste recycling had never been done in any facilities that we're aware of at any major professional sports event, uh, arena, conference uh, center, convention center, nobody had ever recycled anything. And uh, in 1993, the NFL uh, did a brief experiment to try solid waste recycling and see if it could work. It was a uh, qualified failure, but uh, we <laughs> learned so much from our failure that year that we were able to move forward and, and eventually develop a, a system of recycling, which, which now seems very commonplace. But in 1993, no one had a clue how you could recycle materials at a large event. Um, shortly after that, we began uh, recovering food, uh, not just food waste, but prepared foods that could then, in partnership with food banks, be distributed to soup kitchens, shelters, churches, and other organizations to feed people in the host community. Mm -hmm. and, and not very long into this program, the start of this program, we realized that there was a tremendous amount of waste uh, coming out of big events like this. They have a huge footprint. We pretty much take over an entire community. Um, we carpet convention centers. We we put in a lot of materials. So we realized that there was a great opportunity to repurpose these materials and uh, work with nonprofits who could use those things. So we do everything from repurposing carpet to fabric, you know, hundreds of thousands of square feet of carpet and fabric, um, all sorts of materials go to nonprofits now. And that's a program that has continued to grow. Um, we also added a project called Super Kids Super Sharing. I don't have my slide here, but I think that's the next thing up. Um, and that's an opportunity for kids in a local community to help other children by donating gently used or new books, sports equipment, and school supplies. We'll show you more about that later. And then we also, um, by 2002, added in uh, renewable energy credits. So we, we, we surveyed the energy use in all of our big facilities, team hotels, the stadium, other venues we were using to find out how much energy we were, we were using and then offset that with, with rec. And we'll zip through the last couple here because we do have some video to show you of some of these projects. E-waste recycling rally. Uh, we, for many years, we wanted to work with NFL sponsors and try and bring their sustainability agendas in 
to what we're doing and try and somehow merge those sustainability agendas. Verizon was the first significant uh, sponsor who came on board and uh, very much kudos to them for not using it as a promotional marketing opportunity, but for using that partnership as a way to actually make an impact in the host communities. It began with an e-waste recycling rally open to the public. And I believe at our most recent event, we do it every year in partnership with the zoos, at our most recent event, I think we collected over 40 tons of <laughs> e-waste, which was all recycled uh, domestically here. Community greening program began a few years before that in 2005. This has become kind of the centerpiece, the, the trademark of NFL's uh, sustainability programs in communities where we, we, uh, we do a grant program each year and develop multiple uh, events across the entire community, including things like community gardens and food deserts. Uh, we've done coastal restoration. We've done uh, uh, tree plantings, um, uh, restoration. Uh, we've also done pollinator gardens and, um, and also native plant uh, restoration. Yeah. So, and all of these projects have continued to build and grow over the years, but we're always reaching for that next best thing. So in 2018, we did a zero waste project at Super Bowl, which was a huge undertaking when you consider stadiums generate between 40 and 60 tons of trash at a game. And we made sure that more than 90% of all that trash was either reused, recycled, or composted. So that was that was a, a great uh, great achievement. Um, and then last year in Miami, we did a coral reef restoration project, which we'll get into more um, as we go forward. Oh, it doesn't want to change. Hold on one second. Okay. There it goes. There we go. Um, I just wanted to throw this up for a second. I'm sure that uh, that uh, those of you at uh, MIT and others who, who uh, are joining us today as well are familiar with the sustainable development goals. Uh, if, if you're not, you, you certainly will need to be at, at some point because these are the uh, th this is the framework that was developed by the United Nations uh, for uh, aiming toward the year 2030. Uh, and, and these are the 17 different areas uh, that they're addressing. We're not going to go into it here, except to just say that um, through our various programs, and there's a list of the various projects there, um, we've tried as best as we can to address as many of these sustainable development goals uh, as we can through those various programs. Uh, you, you know, for example, just to take the recycling uh, program, recycling, um, keeping uh, materials out of landfills obviously affects uh, clean water. Uh, it affects uh, climate action. It affects life below the water. So, so th there are, are a lot, there, there are multiple ways that these projects uh, impact that. Mm -hmm. And now the fun part. So uh, we, this is the Super Kids Super Sharing Project, one of my favorites. Um, we were looking for a project and a way to involve kids, get the message of environmentalism out to little ones without like preaching it to them, but showing them how it could work. So we looked for a project that would involve the three pillars of sustainability, economic, environmental, and social. And we put together a project called Super Kids Super Sharing. The basis of this is to take um, items that are no longer used, um, books, sports equipment, school supplies, and donate those to kids who can really use them. So you're repurposing, there's your environmental part, economic part, all those items still have value, would otherwise end up eventually in landfills, um, and instead they go to, to other kids. And socially, we love the fact that this brings together really diverse kids to work in partnership on something important. We'll show you what it looks like. Got audio, Karen? Okay. Yeah. No, just good. Today we're at the Super Kids Super Sharing event and it's amazing to see all the youth from in and around the Twin Cities area really work with their classmates really? to gather some maybe gently used or unused items that'll benefit kids and their peers throughout Minnesota. You've got a lot of kids over here who have a lot of extra stuff that's unneeded and now you've got all these kids right over here who have very little. So Super Kids at its most basic is a channel for us to take these items here and move them where they're desperately needed by other kids. As simple as that. This is the fifth year of a sustainability partnership with the NFL Super Bowl. This is so far the biggest one we've seen today. Super Bowl is all about bringing people together. We kind of harness the excitement around Super Bowl for Super Kids. People are already fired up about the game. And this gives them a chance to do something really positive around that game. It's also an opportunity for our kids to be engaged in something bigger than themselves. So understanding that, yeah, there's the culmination of the game at the end. There's so many other things that come along with that. Sports is a vehicle to get to those broader life lessons. 
you can see that curious look when kids look around the room, see people very different from themselves, but they suddenly see something in common. We think that's a great message and a great experience for kids as well. On top of that, they get to go play with the Vikings. <laughs> This is the biggest Super Kids event we've ever done. We are already at 43,460 items. Today's donation is going to go to support access to technology in our classrooms for our high school students. This is bigger than just sports. It's also an opportunity to give back to the community. I'm glad to see that young people in our community and across the state are becoming aware of one another across cultural differences and backgrounds and having an opportunity to really connect and really make an impact on one another's lives. I think you can see there too that uh, despite the fact that Verizon produced that video, uh, they did not take it as an opportunity uh, to market or to promote Verizon. They, they looked at it as an opportunity to really tell a story about how this event um, impacts the community. And as Susan mentioned, you have the economic, the social, and the environmental impacts wrapped up in a program. And on top of that, it is just fun as hell to, 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 uh, um, to, to uh, execute uh, that event. I mean, it takes about nine months of work to get there, but once you get there, it, it's, it's mm -hmm. just a fabulous day for the, uh, uh, for the entire community. Here's a quick look at the uh, uh, urban forestry program. We're using Minnesota as an example. The only reason we're using Minnesota is because they have the coolest graphics, not necessarily the, <laughs> the, 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 the best program, but their graphics were wonderful. So um, what we're looking at right here is just a, an example of some of the projects across there, uh, planting trees, uh, doing uh, pollinator gardens, habitat restoration, uh, the community gardens and food desert neighborhoods. Uh, it, it has a true impact and our objective here um, is to leave a permanent green legacy in each community that hosts our major tentpole events such as Super Bowl, Pro Bowl, and the NFL Draft. We have three criteria for these projects. Number one, um, and these, these are grant applications that are filed by organizations in the community, either uh, NGO or government organizations. And, uh, but, but all of them have to have uh, three major criteria, which are uh, the project has to provide a clear public benefit. Uh, it has to involve native or common species if there are, if there are plantings involved in it. Uh, and there has to be built in a minimum of two years of care and maintenance. So these are not throw something in the ground, you know, leave town, and, and, and it all dies off. That's, that's not a direction that, that we ever want to go in. So one of the fun projects we did last year um, focused on the coast because we were in, uh, in Miami. And all of our projects are tailored to the needs of that specific community. So here in, in Miami, one of the projects was to uh, revitalize uh, Pelican Island, a little island off the coast. It was made with uh, the dirt that was dredged from the intercoastal waterway. Um, and the island has, is now a bird sanctuary. So we, uh, in partnership with some Navy SEALs, we were working on another project with, uh, we did a waterway cleanup, brought out some of our NFL team. Um, we removed invasives, we planted hundreds of uh, native plants and trees, and uh, also cleaned up the island. I think there's another shot here. Um, yeah, so also cleaned up the island. The guy in the middle there actually runs the, um, the uh, housekeeping department at the Miami Dolphins Stadium. So he was great at getting out there and picking up trash. Uh, but it was a great project and, and again very focused on that community and the needs of that community. You know, uh, Susan briefly mentioned the uh, special ops uh, military veterans who are now uh, a, a key partner with uh, NFL and we'll, we'll mention a bit about uh, a bit more about them in just a moment but we do want to take a look at the uh, e-waste recycling uh -huh. rally that we mentioned. The one we're looking at here is in Atlanta so this was Super Bowl uh, 53 which would have been just before Miami. Miami was last year, Atlanta was the year before that. Uh, again, uh, the reason we're highlighting this particular one uh, is because it's got um, it's such, such a great story to tell about it. More than 20 tons of electronic waste, so 40,000 pounds of electronic waste collected then. Um, the, the, it's interesting that we always partner with the local zoo. And the reason why is the materials in your cell phone, laptop, monitors, all your electronic gear, uh, some of the materials in there are mined out of animal habitat. It just so happens by uh, whether it's coincidence or not, uh, that gorilla habitat is a source of many of the minerals that we use in our electronic gear. In order to mine new material, uh, those habitats have to be uh, destroyed. So by recycling those materials and using them over and over, it decreases the need to destroy animal habitat and helps preserve and protect 
uh, those uh, species, which again is, is kind of a side benefit to e-waste, but it's one that the zoos really like. So the last several years, we've partnered with the uh, local zoo. Here's a, here's a quick look at what one of these e-waste recycling rallies uh, looks like. We're thrilled to be hosting alongside Verizon, the National Football League, and Atlanta Super Bowl host committee, the Super Bowl 53 Recycling Rally, where we have asked members of the community to recycle e-waste products that they have. We're seeing everything from computers, TVs, laptops, monitors, vacuum cleaners, designing plug-in or executive engineers. As a conservation organization, we're always looking for ways where we can give people everyday things that they can do to help protect wildlife and their habitat. The stuff today, the stuff that's mined out of animal habitat destroys animal habitat. So the more we can recycle and save and preserve this stuff, the better it is for the environment. So we counted cars as they were coming in, and the 53rd car that drove up got a football because this is all for Super Bowl 53. We were just excited to hear about the recycling event, <laughs> yeah. that they were taking electronics. It was just like getting treated for doing something good for the environment, so that's a great bonus. Super Bowl wouldn't be Super Bowl if it didn't activate a much broader segment of the community than just the sports fans who are here. The E-Waste Drive here today is just one of those examples of something that has nothing to do with football, but is the way to connect to Super Bowl 53. It all ties to our sustainability program in general at Verizon, which we collected over 3.7 million pounds of e-waste at events similar to this since 2009. And we're going towards our goal of 4 million pounds by 2020, which we're on pace to meet that goal this time. You know, it's amazing that 400 families showed up on a rainy, drizzly, miserable day in Atlanta when they could have stayed home instead of recycling their e-waste. But uh, and, and those two little girls were adorable. I don't think they ever dreamed when they got out of bed that morning that a giant panda was going to award them a football. <laughs> so another project that we've done, we wanted to engage our fans. We don't want to preach to our fans and tell them what they should be doing because really they came to watch a football game, not to learn anything about recycling or environment. Um, so we do a project uh, called Recycle and Win, and we engage our, our fantastic green team, some of our favorite people in the world, join us at Super Bowl each year to uh, implement this and other projects. And what we do is we, we catch fans in the act of recycling, and then we reward them with a unique Super Bowl hat and post their photo uh, to social media if they'd like to have it there, and most of them would like to have it there. Um, very fun project, great way to engage the fans and to just, you know, surprise them, get them thinking about the importance of everyday activities. You know, it's just right about the concept. You know, uh, NFL football is about entertainment. It's not about, uh, it's not about sustainability. It's not about the environment. It's not about worrying about climate change. People don't go to a football game or sit down and plunk in front of the TV because they want to be worried. They sit there because they want to forget all about the climate. They want to forget all about uh, the, the problems they're having at work. They just want to be entertained and escape from uh, reality for a little while and watch some and and watch somebody else struggle to get <laughs> to get to get across a goal line. You, you know, but but it, it so so it's that kind of a of of an escape uh, for them. So, so our challenge here was how do we take this entertainment venue and turn it into um, and and incorporate a sustainability. Uh, principles such as recycling, but it has to be something that enhances their experience. It can't be preachy. It can't be information-based. It has to be something that's hands-on. And I'll tell one quick story, especially it's delight. I'm delighted that we had our, our, our colleague David Crawford on here this, uh, this morning, because when he was traveling home from that Super Bowl, we had a unique hat that we awarded Super Bowl fans, yes. a, a, a unique one that didn't um, uh, it, it, I'll show it to you here. Yeah, this you couldn't buy this hat anywhere. You could only win it through our Recycle and Win uh, program. And of course, we did it in Forest Green, uh, obviously. And uh, uh, so David was flying back home to Vancouver via Toronto, and sitting next to him on the plane was a guy wearing, yes, one of our hats. So he was one of our Recycle and Win. And David told us afterwards that uh, this guy went on and on about the, 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 the hat that he won at Super Now, he just went to, the, to the, the biggest sports event in the country, and all he could talk about on, uh, during the flight was this crazy hat that he won because he put something in a, in a recycling bin. That's the kind of 
of uh, uh, emotional reaction that, 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 that is worth a million bucks uh, to us, where we take something as mundane and boring and dull as recycling cans and bottles and turn it into this fabulous story. This guy is going to tell that story for years, and he's going to show his hat off to his friends, and that's his Super Bowl story, is the, 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 the great hat that he won at Super Bowl. And, and every time he goes to recycle something, you can look for a prize, no? And, and, oh, yeah, yeah. And we did, by the way, track all the demographics because our crews who were out there uh, made a deliberate effort to make sure uh, that we were balancing uh, male, uh, female, uh, different races, uh, different, different team supporters as well, too. And, you know, young and old, because we wanted to make sure that we were sort of hitting a, a real cross section of the kind of folks who show up uh, in, in um, uh, you know, at an event like uh, Super Bowl. Uh, and oh, one other thing to mention here too quickly is uh, uh, we do interface with students uh, quite a bit. We had a tremendous group from Penn State University that came out to Nashville to work on the draft. This is all of them uh, arrayed there getting ready for one of their shifts. Uh, they were doing the Recycle and Win campaign. Uh, they went through a training course in both hospitality and sustainability so that they not only knew how to interact in a really positive way with fans, but they also knew how to answer questions if they came up. They were not there to preach or, or, or to give information, but they could answer questions when they went out. And we also arranged for some top executives from both NFL and from the local community to meet with them in, in, a, in a really informal fireside chat format and talk about their career path from student to uh, being at the top of their, uh, their, their professions. Uh, so that these students had a great experience. One of the students told us later that it was one of the most educational sessions uh, that he had ever participated in in four years at Penn State. I don't mean that as a criticism of Penn State, by the way. So, uh, yeah. So we wanted to tell you a little bit about one of our very water-focused projects, since we have you guys here today. Um, it, last year in Miami, we started a project to restore a coral reef. As you probably know, uh, coral reefs in the in the world are in huge trouble, and are um, the only barrier reef in the U.S. is off the coast of Florida, and it's, it's been breaking down over years because of, you know, increasing water temperatures and pollution in the water and acidification of the water. So we teamed up with a group called Force Blue. Um, they're all retired special ops, uh, incredible divers, very hard to keep up with if you ever swim with them, which we tried. Um, and, and also with other groups, because we're finding some of these environmental issues are much bigger than any group can handle. So we brought in our host committee, we brought in Force Blue, we brought in Florida Department of Environmental Protection. Uh, the governor's office eventually got involved and wanted to do more around, around coral restoration. University of Miami joined us, Frost Science Museum, a bunch of groups to, to try and rebuild this reef. And it's a project that's continuing, but we'll show you the video because it shows it much better than I can say. It's been two years since Force Blue trained its first team of special operations veterans. What began as a novel way to utilize these elite warriors' skills of training in service of our oceans and to return to them the sense of purpose and belonging they had in the military has quickly grown into a model of caring, cooperation, and positive change with the power to restore lives of the planet. We're rescuing at-risk frags of Elkhorn Coral to help recovery over at those sites that were damaged by the hurricanes yeah. Irma and Maria. To take the training that we had and implement it to real world use, that's one of the things I loved about the military is we had mission, we had purpose, there was something we were doing every single day and there was reason behind it. It feels good. That self-respect and dignity that I had from the Marine Corps. No challenge, no adventure, nothing has filled that space until Force Blue. Force Blue brings this ability to accomplish these amazing tasks. Instead of being able to save 20 corals, we might be able to save 200 or 2,000. We end here tonight with a group of veterans on a new mission. They become eco-warriors out to save coral reefs, and in some cases, themselves. News outlets across the country have told the Force Blue story. We don't advertise this as a therapy program, but the process of it is very profound for the people involved. Now, we have a rare opportunity to tell that story to the world. <laughs> How does planting 100 corals in honor of the NFL's 100th season sound? Well, it sounds like they're making a difference. This fall, in honor of the NFL's 100th season, Super Bowl 54 in Miami, and America's military veterans, Force Blue will be spearheading 100 Yards of Hope, a football field-sized coral reef restoration project in the waters of South Florida. We're at the restoration site, so we've arranged the plot to look like a football field. So each buddy group is actually going to take one of the yard lines to outplant 12 corals to build the perimeter of the field. 
and then we're going to complement the inner part with a lot more of the high density restoration to really make a beautiful site. And this is entirely different. Most of the things that I've done have been more on the demolition side, so this is pretty neat in the restoration side. Capitalizing on the platform afforded by the NFL in its centennial season, the millions of fans will be tuning into Super Bowl 54. Forest Blue intends to make this the most comprehensive, most collaborative restoration effort ever mounted. But we need your support. Join us on this historic mission and help the special operations veterans of Force Blue showcase what's possible when we all care enough to care. Visit www.forceblueteam.org. So we are continuing to work with Force Blue as we move into uh, Super Bowl in Tampa. It just so happens the aquarium in Tampa, Florida Aquarium, uh, raised the coral that we planted in Tampa. So we're going to continue that effort and the Force Blue guys are continuing to move forward. And I just have to say of all the projects we've worked on, we've done a lot of really um, impactful projects where we've built community gardens, planted trees, done, done some, some good. Um, this one I think just, just gave us goosebumps. I mean, to, to snorkel out over the area where these guys these former veterans, were, these veterans, former military guys, were working side by side with scientists was just um, inspiring. It was just, there's, I've never seen anything like it to look down through all that blue water and see this area being restored. And they have been back there now to check on it. And all those little baby corals are growing together and forming a thicket. Uh, they send us photos where that area that once looked like just a desert um, now has not only the corals growing, but octopus are back, fish are feeding there. Um, it's just, it's so cool to see, to see that kind of a restoration effort and know that it's possible. Lobsters. They have lobsters. Lobsters there are there too, yeah. yeah. And they have lobsters. Yeah. Now they have lobsters. You know, uh, we, we, uh, we went in the water with the uh, seals. We, we grabbed our snorkel gear and went and tried to keep up with them. Uh, <laughs> I gave up halfway through the mission. Uh, Susan stuck it out through the entire day. And yeah. how long did it take you to recover? I was spraying my toe trying to snorkel. It's not easy to snorkel in open ocean, I found out. Um, so yeah, I was I was sore for a while. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you don't you don't try and keep up with Navy SEALs. I'm sorry, no, that, that's not something you do. I, one interesting anecdote, a historical note for you as well. The the uh, the, the Navy SEALs and Special Ops uh, UDT teams, underwater demolition teams, were, were were formed originally back in World War II, and you may have heard the term frogmen. They were referred to back then as frogmen. Um, and, and they were formed for one purpose. They were formed to go in and take high, uh, uh, high energy explosives and destroy coral reefs so that landing craft could get in close enough to shore uh, to protect uh, uh, soldiers who were, uh, American soldiers who were going uh, ashore during uh, combat. Uh, and, and here now you fast forward 65 years into the future and here are, are the descendants of those uh, uh, original UDT teams and their mission now is to restore and rebuild and protect uh, coral reefs. So the, the irony of that and, and, and the, the sort of close the circle has, has certainly not been, uh, not been lost on us. Yeah, well that and the fact that these guys are also healing themselves in addition to healing that reef. We had some of these, these vets came up and talked to us afterwards. One of them, it was the first time he had been diving uh, in year. He, first time he'd been diving in sunlight. Yes. He always did missions in the dark, cover of darkness. Um, and this was the first time he'd been in the ocean and actually seen what it looked like down there in daylight. And it's just, it's just gives you chills to talk to these guys and know what they've been through and how this is helping them and giving them a new purpose to use those skills. Well, one of the other guys who was in the video there too uh, came and chatted with us afterwards. And he said it was the first time he'd been in the water and nobody was shooting at him. That's true, yeah. So, yeah. so this, cool. this yeah. was an experience for these, uh, these veterans. I, I, I do want to wrap up with one more future note for you. And uh, we, uh, we talked very briefly to Karen about this earlier because of her interest in marine biology. And Susan just touched on it for a second. But we are working on a project in uh, Tampa. Uh, we're not doing a coral reef restoration, although we, we, we are looking at ways to support the coral reef restoration across on the other coast, uh, because we're still partnering with Force Blue and many of the other organizations. And as Susan mentioned, the corals, the super corals that are being transplanted there to restore the reefs are being grown in laboratories uh, in uh, Tampa and then transported across. So, so there is a connection between the two, but there is a need for coastal restoration in the Tampa Bay area. Uh, so a couple of the projects that we're working on, in addition to doing some shore cleanups and removing plastic and debris from uh, the, the uh, picnic island as well, uh, we're looking at doing a massive mangrove planting um, uh, project along the uh, coast there uh, with larger, larger mangrove trees, but also with hundreds, perhaps thousands, we, we haven't finished the numbers yet, of mangrove seedlings. Many of them will have been grown by students in school, in their schools, 
for the purpose of transplanting them along the shore. There's multiple benefits. Number one, mangroves are, are a great uh, opportunity for carbon sequestration, but they also provide habitat uh, for marine animals and fish. Uh, and uh, they also uh, stabilize shorelines and, and uh, hold down erosion. So all in all, it's a, it's a great project that's going to have a tremendous impact on the community. We have our fingers crossed because this is not a normal year for us as it is for none of you is, is this a normal year. So what we're, we have contingency plans for all of our projects this year. In other words, uh, here's how we're going to proceed um, w without regard to COVID-19. COVID-19 uh, is no longer a factor. Here's how we'll proceed. Our contingency plans say, here's how we proceed if COVID-19 is still extant throughout uh, the population and we have to take certain measures and here are the measures we'll take in terms of PPE, in terms of distancing, in terms of congregation, in terms of spacing out projects. So we, we have a lot of contingency plans yeah. for that. It's a very different year uh, for yeah. all of us. Yeah. You know, there's one project too we didn't touch on and that was uh, elimination of plastics at Super Bowl last oh, year in yeah. Miami. Yeah. Huge project, huge undertaking. First time we know of a stadium that has done this. Um, and we didn't, yeah, we didn't touch on it, but I want to mention it because I know you guys had a, a workshop or a presentation on plastics recently and the, just the damage they're doing. What's the estimate by 2050, there may be more plastic than fish in the ocean if we keep going at this rate. Um, so the stadium uh, started the season, actually it started well into the season, um, and they, they did a survey of all the plastics that were being used in the stadium. There were 144 different items. By Super Bowl, within just a few months, they were down to 14. They found ways to eliminate um, eliminate plastic almost entirely, 99%. Yeah, so that was great. And we're happy to take any questions on yeah, that it, or other projects. And I'll just mention on the plastic reduction project that we've, uh, we have we were tasked by the commissioner to do a full report on that with recommendations, uh, which we, we, we created. And we're in the process now of distributing that to all of our teams and facilities throughout the NFL so that they can, uh, you, you know, find, find, procedures and ideas and, and suggestions in that report that they can implement in their own stadiums mm -hmm. to cut down on single use plastic. So I, I, I you know, would, would venture to say that the NFL is probably going to be the leader in sports when it comes to reducing single use plastic. However, we also have permission from the folks at Hard Rock mm -hmm. Stadium in Miami to share that report with other sports leagues. And it's interesting that in the last couple of years, you guys probably know that w between basketball, uh, uh, football, uh, baseball, and, and, uh, and what's the other thing? Uh, on ice. What do they do? Hockey. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I grew up as a hockey player. I'm just kidding. So, uh, the, the, you know, between these sports leagues, we compete, you know, uh, uh, head to head for everything, for, uh, for sponsorship dollars, for broadcast rights, for audience, for marketing, for merchandise. You know, we're, we're, we're in locked in, in deathly competition with all these other sports leagues, but there is one area where we work together, we talk together, we share best practices, and that area is the area of sustainability. Uh, and and we're, we're constantly looking for new ways that we can work together with NBA, MLB, and, and with NHL uh, to, to try and address these issues and, and share the way we're doing it. And, um, I, you know, I have to admit that, that we firmly believe the NFL has, has been obviously the, the, the progenitor of all this and, and has been the leader in it, but we, we have learned a lot from our colleagues at the other sports leagues because we all have different approaches toward this. So. And I think one of the cool things about projects like this is it has the potential to drive societal change. So if stadiums are wanting to get rid of plastics, all the folks who package things in plastic are gonna have to respond. Um, and we're seeing now some of those big companies step up and say, okay, well, what else can we do? How can we do this? Um, and, and I think it has the potential to drive tremendous change. Yeah. yeah. Well, we're wide open for uh, questions. That's that's pretty much our presentation. We're actually a little bit ahead of schedule, which is a, a, an incredibly rare event for <laughs> Susan and I. So we'll turn it back over to you guys. Oh, Jack, I have the first question here. Okay, thank you. Jack, how soon your team arrived to the Super Bowl host city? Well, uh, the, our, our full team that works on material recovery, recycle and win campaigns, and, and all those other uh, uh, programs, we have a green week, uh, two, two weeks before Super Bowl week, we have a green week, we call it, before the players get there and everything, Super Bowl week, everything's about the game. Everything is all the publicity, all the spotlight is on the game. So two weeks before that, uh, it's, it's all about community. So uh, we will have typically one or two community greening events. We'll run the Super Kids event that you saw. We'll also run the e-waste recycling rally in partnership with Verizon, and we pack all of that sustainability and environmental uh, stuff into that one week. Um, so 
a, a few members of our team are there for that. The rest of the folks arrive uh, usually the, uh, several days before Super Bowl and then stay through the entire week afterwards because our material repurposing program is an enormous program. It takes a lot of uh, manpower and a lot of, uh, a lot of expertise to get it done. However, in terms of if you're talking about when do we start working on Super Bowl, we start sometimes as early as 18 months in advance of the Super Bowl, where we begin the planning process, the budgeting process, where we begin traveling to the next host community mm -hmm. to host uh, community meetings, to start listening to folks in the community about what the, what, the, what the sustainability concerns in that community are. This is how we find out about things like coral reef restoration. We find out about things such as uh, uh, coastal uh, restoration and in uh, all these other types of projects in the community. And then we work in partnership with folks to try and design programs within the limits of, of what our resources are. And, and honestly, we could do very little if it was only our resources that we could depend on. But by partnering with all these like-minded uh, organizations and agencies and bringing them to the table, we're able to, to do uh, amazing things over the course of that uh, 18 months. And many of the greening projects will start you know, six, seven months yeah, out. It's, it's, we usually start our first, our first community greening project in the spring. This yeah. year we're pushing back to the fall and hoping we can do it then. Um, but yeah, we're in, we're in that community a lot, probably what, eight times before Super Bowl? Um, and, and we're already in touch with the future hosts of Super Bowl. So we're already talking to Los Angeles and New Orleans and Phoenix and all the guys that are coming up. You know, Susan and I have a bit of background in community organizing as well, too. People always ask, well, you know, what did you study in school to have a job like this? And it's like, ah, oh, you, you don't want to know. We, <laughs> we, 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 we come from very different backgrounds. And, and through a lot of, of training over the years uh, is how we've been able to put this together. We, we have skills in communications and in project management in community organizing. So, for example, one of our first uh, uh, tasks in a community is to bring together all those NGOs that might be able to repurpose and reuse materials. And oftentimes they don't know who they are. They don't know what the heck they're going to do with 100,000 uh, 100, square feet of nylon fabric. Uh, but we train them, we teach them, we give them examples from previous mm -hmm. uh, uh, host communities of innovative and creative ways that people have used it. I'll, I'll just give you one, just, just one out of a hundred creative ways. In Minneapolis, there was a group called Bundles of Love. Mm -hmm. They took over 150,000 square feet of our fencing material, which was really high quality, really like gorgeous. Yeah, yeah. We, yeah, it was a Jersey, a, a beautiful Jersey material. Um, they cut it into patterns, sewed it, had volunteers sew it, turned it into little baby clothes outfits, and then took those baby clothes and donated them to uh, uh, family shelters throughout the Minneapolis-St. Paul area. Mm -hmm. So this is stuff. This is stuff that normally would have gone to a landfill for most major events. And instead, now, you have all the little babies running around in little Super Bowl outfits. <laughs> Super babies. Uh, you, you know, so, so that's, you, you know, the, these are the kind of creative things that we're able to do only because we partner with all these organizations and we sit down and listen to them. So Jack and Susan, there's a question that sort of follows right up on that. It's how do you source projects and how are the projects decided on? And does the NFL have key SDGs they want to touch upon each year? So we do some projects consistently. Um, I mean, we always do community greening tailored to what that community needs, but we also always do food recovery. Uh, last year in Miami, we collected enough food that was prepared and unserved to provide 47,500 meals. There's a lot of stuff left over. So food security is a huge thing. Um, I think we always look for things like an opportunity to build community gardens and again, address food insecurity. Um, material recovery is also a given. Um, and energy offset. So there are some things that we look to do in each community and then I think from there tailor it to what that community needs. Well, we start off with two things. We start mm -hmm. off with two objectives. Our first objective is how do we mitigate the environmental impact of what we're gonna do? You cannot bring 100,000 people into a city, I, I don't care how big the city is, and not impact the environment of that city through uh, transportation, through, uh, through, through, through uh, uh, food waste, through, through mm -hmm. solid waste, through j just all the ways that we as, as, as humans impact our environment. So our number one, uh, or, or one of our priorities, I shouldn't yeah. say it's number one yeah. because they're both important. How do we mitigate the environmental impact? And Susan mentioned a lot of that, you know, waste and food and energy and, and, and all this stuff. The, the second part of it though is how do we create a green legacy? How do we pick up our, our tents and move it, it, you know, a, a week or two after Super Bowl and we're, we, we know for sure that that community has some certain improvements and permanent benefits left mm -hmm. behind 
because we were there in that community. So we've got legacy and we've got mitigation are our two things. Underneath those two, everything kind of changes and morphs from uh, year to year. For example, in Minneapolis, they had a, um, a really robust food uh, uh, organics composting program mm -hmm. that we could plug into. It hadn't been fully utilized by the stadium or facilities yet, but working together with the stadium and the caterers and everyone else, we were able to plug into that composting program and we were able to have a true zero waste Super Bowl where 99 plus percent of, of all the waste there, none of it went to a, a, a landfill. Um, so, so, you know, we have to adapt to whatever it is. In Miami, we, were, we, were, we could not find the compost infrastructure that we needed. So we had to, you know, tap dance a bit. We had to say, what are other ways that we can reduce waste in this, um, in this stadium and from our other events? So it does, it changes a lot mm -hmm. each year. And that's one of the things that makes the, the job, as Susan said, it, it's very exciting. Um, it's also one of the reasons why uh, some folks have come and gone over the years, have worked with us for a little while, and then quit in disgust because they can't stand the fact that there's nothing solid to hold on to. Everything changes and everything goes wrong, and we probably spend a, a fair amount of our time fixing the stuff that doesn't work and that goes wrong. For some folks, that's the end of the line. For us, it's like that's what we that's, challenge. Oh yeah, that's what gets us out of bed in the morning, knowing that there's a problem and we 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 need to find a way to solve it. Uh, that that I think that has a lot to do with whatever your particular personality type. So Jack and Susan, have you done any programs with any of the HBCUs, historically black colleges and universities? Yeah, we yes, have. we we, we have. As a matter of yeah. fact, uh, it, it, through uh, Super Kids and also through our uh, material recovery program in Texas, we worked with um, Paul. Uh, Oh, oh gosh, I, I, there's a uh, uh, historically black uh, university in um, uh, right outside of Houston uh, that we worked very closely with on some uh, material recovery uh, programs and on uh, community gardens. They, uh, Paul Quinn, Paul Quinn uh, College in Texas. Uh, Paul Quinn College has a tremendous, every student who graduates from Paul Quinn graduates debt free, w which just, 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 blew our minds when we first met with the folks from Paul Quinn College. Um, they, they have programs on campus. They have their own farm, not just gardens, but they have a, a huge farm and students who need to uh, uh, pay for their own tuition, students who are not eligible for scholarships, are able to be employed at the farm, work on the farm, pay their tuition through the money they make at the farm, and, and they run their own farmer's markets on a weekly basis, uh, and the farm generates tremendous revenue. A lot of the materials that we had left over they found ways to utilize those on the farm. Like I can't, a lot of the lumber that we had, they sent a flatbed truck over and collected, uh, you know, a, a flatbed load of lumber that they later used to in some of the garden building. So, uh, you know, we don't specifically look for the uh, HBUs, but we always look for whatever the opportunities are. If there's a historically black college that we can work with, we work with them. If there's a religious organization we can work with, we've worked with the Catholic diocese all across uh, the, the uh, country. Uh, we've worked with uh, Jewish organizations. We just, you know, what's available in this community and, and who has the desire uh, to, to work with us on these projects? Yeah, Jackie, Susan, Wait, oh, we ahead. have one question from Brazil, Wanderson. Uh, he said, Jackie and Susan, how many people the NFL green impact each year? Um, we, uh, flying into the community for Super Bowl, I, well, the, the, the total audience we have for, for NFL, I think, how many people are on the planet now? Is there 7 billion? Yeah. I, I, I think our total audience is somewhere around 6.9 billion. I'm not really, yeah. no, no, I'm yeah, not, no, you know, it, it's, it's, it's enormous. But for Super Bowl, for example, uh, the stadium capacity is typically somewhere between 65 and 70,000 in the stadium. The, uh, broadcast uh, capability is in the uh, uh, tens of, of millions domestically. Mm -hmm. Plus, there are roughly 53 international broadcasts of Super Bowl each year as well, too, uh, including uh, countries around the world where uh, n n no one understands anything about American football, but they don't care because it's Super Bowl. Yeah. It's uh, le, 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 le Super Tazon. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> yeah. so we, um, but uh, we just recently did some figures for our uh, carbon offsets. And um, we had, uh, we estimated roughly 80,000 people will fly out of the city the day after the game. And typically all of those folks are in the city 
for uh, the Super Bowl. You're not going to find a lot of business travelers mixed in with there. That's the Super Bowl crowd that's moving out. But in addition to that, people drive in. So a lot more people yeah. attend the events around Super Bowl um, than, than actually attend the game, I think, is the way the numbers break out. Because we have like we have something called Super Bowl Experience. It's like a big football theme park. It's, you know, um, the, there's a Super Bowl Live that's free and open to everybody. It's everything football you can imagine. So a lot of people come in just for the, uh, the events around. It. Let, let me, let me uh, uh, Cassiano, let, let me give you just an example of the scale that I actually know the numbers and I don't have to pretend it's 6.9 billion. I actually know some numbers. Uh, we, the NFL draft, where the, where the, the, the new players get drafted uh, from, from their colleges to play in the NFL. The NFL draft occurs every year in the spring. Um, it used to be kind of a closed event. It took place at Radio City Music Hall in Manhattan. Um, I think Radio City Music Hall holds a couple of thousand people. So those were the attendees. And then it would be broadcast, you know, the, the draft would be broadcast usually on cable TV. Uh, about five or six years ago, we decided to take it out of house and turn it into a public event. We took it to Chicago, to uh, Grant Park in downtown Chicago. And it, it, we were overwhelmed by what happened there. We built a theme park in Grant Park. Uh, we built exhibits and activations and all mm -hmm. kinds of fun games and, and, and just great, great stuff to attract people. Uh, a lot of food and beverage service, it just neat stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, the draft theater itself was open so that people could observe the draft. And we got somewhere, we had estimated that we would get up to 100,000 people come in for the draft. I believe that first year we got closer to 200,000 and our event company if you can imagine rebuilding an airplane while it's in the air, that was what they did. They, 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 they were expanding the footprint of the, the, the event site as people were streaming in so that they could accommodate that number of, of uh, uh, people. Uh, we moved, uh, for, we stayed in Chicago another year. Uh, we went off to, um, to uh, uh, Philadelphia. We went, went to Texas, to Nashville. And then um, uh, the, the last... Well, th this year, of course, we were, we were all virtual, uh, but the year, last year we were in Nashville. We expected to, to get a quarter of a million people to come to the city to participate in the draft activities and all the fun and all the hoopla. 600,000 people came to Nashville to attend the NFL draft. 600,000 out of a projected audience of 250,000. This past year, we were supposed to be in Las Vegas on the Las Vegas Strip. Obviously, we had to cancel it, but the projections from the folks in Las Vegas, they projected that up to 1 million people were going to come to Las Vegas simply to participate and to be part of the NFL draft. So I think that maybe that gives you sort of a, a, a scale of uh, numbers to think about. It's overwhelming uh, to us, but Susan mentioned this before, and I think it's important to mention this. Uh, less than 17% of people in this country pay any attention at all to science news, sustainability, climate change, pandemics, the important stuff. There's a very small percentage of people who pay attention to that. You know, uh, according to a survey that we just made up for this conversation <laughs> from the White House, actually, and, but the last administration. And, uh, <laughs> you know, but more than 70 percent of the people in this country, according to surveys that we didn't make up, more than 70 percent um, pay attention to sports somehow. Sports news, sports broadcast, attending sports event, reading about sports. So if you wanted to get a sustainability message in front of a huge audience, um, you could you could do it in front of a small scientific uh, conference uh, or. You can throw it, you can wrap it around a, an NFL football and toss it up in the air at Super Bowl, like we do with the Recycle and Win campaign. And all of a sudden, you're gonna, that message is going to reach uh, a, an audience of, of, of tens of millions, maybe hundreds of millions of people, uh, and, and hopefully in an entertaining way that mm -hmm. they'll, they'll remember and talk about to their friends. So we have a wonderful question. Um, and by the way, everybody, please feel free to stay on board. We've got a number of great questions for Jack and Susan. They're willing to hang out with us and answer them. So hopefully we'll, we can you know, make sure that everyone's question gets answered. So we have a wonderful question from Andrew, one of the, the co-president of MIT Water. Um, it, he's saying that, um, are there other organizations that you communicate around the large scale event sustainability. And I know you mentioned that a little bit, but anywhere else that you've learned or borrowed from, such as college sports, large concert tours, and where do you think your best practices could be applied to have a large impact? Hmm. I, well, well, I, I can address some of that. Um, if any of you have read uh, Stephen Covey's uh, books, uh, one is the, uh, uh, the Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, that's that's one of our Bibles that we uh, we, we we go back to uh, frequently. His last uh, uh, habit is to sharpen the saw. Um, if you were a carpenter, you would certainly keep your your saws and your tools sharp. Uh, we believe in sharpening the saw constantly. Sharpening the saw for us means to constantly be studying what other organizations and other people are doing, uh, to do the research on it, to subscribe to online newsletters about sustainability and sport. Uh, there, there's actually uh, one or two online magazines uh, dedicated to sustainability and sport. So we keep up with the Bundesliga. We keep up with the uh, the uh, uh, English Premier League. We keep up with uh, with FIFA, with the uh, IOC, and, and and we try and see, you know, what are they doing? Is it working? Is it something that we can apply? And, and, and do we like it? Mm-hmm. And at the same time, uh, we try and communicate uh, when we can. Uh, we typically will attend the Green Sports Alliance conference uh, each year, and uh, usually we'll do a presentation about what our, our latest projects are, and, and we're very open about sharing information. We do not keep our projects and our ideas as proprietary, uh, because we really do want to get the sustainability information out yeah. there as well. Um, yeah. and, and, and we study, too. Uh, Susan's just wrapping up a, a course at uh, uh, University of Copenhagen on um, SDGs. Um, uh, you know, there's some oddball stuff too. Our biggest concern right now is COVID-19 around some of our events. Uh, so the um, um, Johns Hopkins has an online class in um, COVID-19 and specifically about contact tracing. I'm not planning to quit this job and become a contact tracer, but uh, but I do want to learn all of that kind of stuff. So I'm just wrapping up that course right now. So it may seem a little bit out there from what we do, uh, but but we know that we can apply some of those principles. So so the the answer is a, is an unqualified yes. We're, we're constantly trying to get more information from every yeah. possible source we can get it from. Yeah, and we are in touch with the other leagues pretty yeah. pretty often. You know, we know the sustainability leagues at MLB and NHL and, and the other uh, sports leagues. So we do share best practices and talk to them about issues they have coming up and that we're finding as well. Um, and as far as where this could be applied, we think any event could and should be doing this stuff. And we're happy to share those best practices. Um, concerts, there, there's a group that we talk with quite often. Um, I think they've borrowed some of our best practices and, and uh, have kind of run with those. Um, but I think really it could be applied pretty broadly to any, any large scale event. Yeah, if we, if, if we come across something at one of the other sports leagues that we don't think is, is, is getting the job done, we don't get upset and we don't preach to them, but we tease them mercilessly. <laughs> We, we do all tend to use the same venues, you know, the big sports venues. So if we follow another league into a venue and we know that they trashed all their stuff, they're going to hear about it from us. You know, so, yeah, we do. We do tease them. <laughs> you, know, you know, I should mention right here, too, another thing that we've done. We've talked about cooperation with other organizations. We develop a really robust database each year in that community of NGOs. In fact, when we bring uh, uh, 15, 20, 25 NGOs to the table uh, to develop this material recovery program, in most cases, those folks know who the others are. You know, we'll have Habitat, we'll have Salvation Army, we'll have uh, Goodwill Industries, we'll have uh, local shelters, we, we'll have all kinds of NGOs that we bring in to, to work artist groups, um, uh, the design schools, organizations, yeah. schools, yeah. universities, university design programs. We bring them all to the table. They may know who those other organizations are, but they've never met them. They've, they've never been in the same room with them. So we formed this ad hoc partnership with all of these local folks in the community, a partnership that would not have ever formed if we hadn't come to town and, and brought all these folks to the table. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and they've mentioned it to us uh, several times. In Minneapolis, uh, w- one of the uh, leaders from the Salvation Army was there and, and uh, spoke to the group. And he said, you know, because you guys brought us all to the table, he said, sometimes I get shipments of material that are donated to us and we don't have the capacity to put it in all of our stores. He said, some of that stuff we have to send to a landfill. He said, we may get a truckload of brand new backpacks. Well, I don't, I don't have any place to go with 8,000 backpacks. Mm-hmm. I can, I can you know, sell 2,000. And he said, but now that, that you've brought us all together, he said, I've got all these folks, that I, resources that I have now where I can call folks and say, hey, I got 6,000 backpacks. You want 1,000, you want 1,000. Um, yeah. But what we do is we take that database that we develop and we hand it off to the next organization that's coming into the city. It could be the X Games, um, it could be the NCAA Final Four, uh, it could be the NHL, and we say, look, we spent a year and a half putting this stuff together. You know, all you guys have to do is make a phone call because they, they are experienced, 
uh, they, 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 they know procedures and drills. They know the logistics of how to uh, recapture material. They've been trained for how to use the material. All you got to do is, is call them and, and work with them on this kind of stuff. So mm -hmm. we, th we see that as one of those legacy components. You know, have we left that community better than we found it? And, and we think that's a real, uh, it, you know, and again, it, it really is a testament to the league itself for supporting us for doing all this crazy stuff. Um, I, I can honestly say that there's, I, I don't think there's ever been a project that we proposed uh, to upper management at NFL that they have, um, that they've rejected. Uh, they've made us sit on it for a while sometimes because they, they, we had to do some lobbying internally to convince folks. Uh, for instance, we had to really lobby hard to get the sponsorship group to even allow us to talk to uh, uh, sponsors. Uh, but we've had lots of support within the league and, and never really suffered from folks just putting their hand up and saying, no, you can't do that. Yeah. Uh, the, ne the next two questions. Uh, the first one coming from Greece and the second one coming from Romania. Uh, what metric do you use to measure the environment impact of your events? And do you collect data or emission impacts? This is the first one. And the second one is, um, could you please share with us some tips and tricks how to organize a sustainable event at small scale? Okay. Um, Both good ones. Let me talk about the first one and have Susan talk about tips and tricks. And when you're done, we have two more. <laughs> okay. Because okay. Susan is trickier than I am. <laughs> uh, the, uh, in terms of data and uh, uh, emissions, um, we do, there's, th th this is a, a, a two-part answer. The answer to that is yes and no. Um, the yes part of it is we do a lot of measurements in advance of things like electricity usage for all of our venues for the entire time of our tenancy. So we talk about the stadium for Super Bowl. We're not referring just to Super Bowl Sunday. We're referring to the three weeks before Super Bowl that we're in there building out the stadium. For example, even if it's a brand new stadium, we go in and we tear down and rebuild portions of that stadium. Obviously, we have to put it back the way we found it afterwards. Um, most NFL stadiums can accommodate anywhere from 200 to 300 uh, media people. Um, we need spaces uh, for uh, up to 5,000 media people. And when I say spaces, I don't just mean a seat. I mean a seat, a table, uh, an internet connection, uh, power, uh, you, you know, visibility for monitors, for replays, and all this kind of stuff. So there's a lot of building out that goes to create uh, spaces for those thousands of media. We need broadcast booths for up to 50 or more broadcast organizations from around the world, both radio and television. So these all have to be built into uh, the stadium. So there's a lot of, of building that goes on. So that three weeks before Super Bowl and the week afterwards when we're tearing down, we look at that as this is within our scope. Um, so we look at what is the uh, electric usage for that period, what are the emissions that result from that, and how do we offset those emissions. In terms of reduction, we have yet to come up with a strategy to reduce the electricity use because everybody needs the, the power, for, especially on Super Bowl Sunday. But we can do the offsets. Typically, we use renewable energy certificates equivalent uh, to, to the number of megawatt uh, hours of energy that are used during that month. But we don't stop there. We also do the NFL headquarters hotel for two weeks. We do the team hotels for a week. We do the media center. We do the um, Super Bowl experience convention center site, which as Susan mentioned, is the largest open public event mm -hmm. at Super Bowl each year. Um, and, and so we, we measure that um, in advance. We do estimates based on previous years. Uh, we we uh, make a deal for renewable energy certificates. And then afterwards we get the actual numbers, which usually are pretty close to our estimates because we've gotten good at this over the years. Now, in terms of monitoring and measuring other things, we do measure- Jack, uh, can I ask, do you add in transportation in that as well? Uh, uh, we, we typically don't add in the transportation, but this year for the first time, we are adding in um, transportation. Well, let, let me put it this way. There have been years where we've been able to find uh, somebody from outside the league, a sponsor or someone else, who's willing to work with us on transportation offsets. Uh, that tends to be sponsor driven rather than uh, internally. Uh, this year, we're looking potentially at a sponsor who wants to come in and do carbon offset uh, offsetting for all of our transportation use. So. We do already have the estimates on it, the number of flights, the distance of flights, the emissions as a result of those flights, plus our ground transportation. We already have all the estimates on the uh, carbon uh, uh, produced by that. And we're working on that for this year. But I, I, I have to admit, it's gonna be an off again, on again thing. I don't think it's gonna be something we do every year. We are though looking at a voluntary fan offset program that we may be able to implement in coming years. 
Uh, that's that, that, you know, again, that's one of those to be determined things. In terms of other impacts, um, in terms of the, uh, both the solid waste and the food uh, recovery, uh, we do monitor all of that and we do uh, record how much uh, food is kept out of the landfills and distributed. And we do a couple of metrics. One metric we do is what's the total amount of food that was recovered, uh, food and beverages. The second metric is how many uh, people in this community were fed as a result of that. The third metric, we use the WARM model out of EPA. I, I don't know if everybody's familiar with that, but it's W-A-R-M. It's the, it's, the, um, it's, it's the model that EPA created in order to measure um, uh, greenhouse gas emission uh, from, from all types of sources. Uh, so we use that to compute how much the reduction in greenhouse gas is by diverting um, the food material and the other solid materials, mm -hmm. uh, everything from event uh, uh, carpeting, uh, decor, lumber, uh, uh, turf, uh, building materials, uh, how much is uh, greenhouse gas emissions reduced as a result of not putting all that stuff in a landfill. So those are some of the metrics uh, that we uh, uh, develop each year. Do those get shared with the um, NFL annual report or a sustainability report? Those, uh, most of those, most of those three numbers that I just talked about, solid waste, uh, emissions reduction, uh, food waste, and uh, I'm sorry, the, the fourth one, and the uh, uh, electric um, emissions, uh, those are made available. Uh, we don't distribute them very widely, but uh, typically if we get inquiries from media about them, we release those figures uh, for uh, media inquiries. Um, some stuff is, is uh, uh, proprietary. Uh, for instance, we've, we've been asked if we measure the entire footprint of Super Bowl, uh, to which I say, oh, good Lord, really? Uh, I, mean, <laughs> I mean, this is the biggest single day event in the world. Um, we, we measure selected portions of the footprint that we can actually get data on. But, but here's the other challenge, too. If we were running Super Bowl in Miami every year, I can guarantee you that we would have a carbon footprint right down to the, uh, to, to the ton, right down to the pound of, of carbon, and we would be able to address it every single year uh, and, and probably address the entire thing. But every year we're in a different city with a different infrastructure, we're dealing with different folks. And honestly, once we get done in Miami, um, Miami is in our rearview mirror and, and we wave bye-bye uh, and we go off to Tampa. You know, when we finish up in Tampa, Tampa we, our life will, will rotate all around Tampa for the next uh, uh, 10 months. Um, a, a month after Super Bowl, again, it's going to be ta-ta Tampa, and we're off to, to, to Phoenix. So in terms of following up uh, year after year, um, I have to admit that there's very little, if any, follow-up year after year because um, it, it's so overwhelming to be in a new city and to be developing all these projects. In the Before I go on to the next two questions, Yes. Um, I, as far as metrics, there's one that I feel is important, and given that we're at MIT Water Club, uh, have you thought, given any t consideration into the water metric in, in your events? Well, th there, are, there have been two uh, events in, in recent years uh, where water has become a, an issue for us. One was in Arizona and the other was in Texas. We were uh, in Texas for uh, Super Bowl not all that long ago under uh, drought conditions. I want to say, was it 10 years ago, maybe nine? Somewhere yeah, there. Yeah. Um, and, and well, of course, Texas always has a drought, uh, uh, you know, but uh, th there was really severe drought conditions. Um, so we worked with the local water district and talked about what can we do to address that. Um, and, and, now, you keep in mind though that we don't own the infrastructure there. So, so if someone comes to us and says, hey, how about installing a low flow, uh, 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 you know, waterless urinals, low flow shower heads, uh, changing all this, and we say, well, you know, if you rent a hotel room for a week, I doubt the hotel is going to let you change their infrastructure. You're, you're just renting it. We basically lease the stadium for a month. Um, and, and although we make a lot of improvements to the stadium, we basically have to leave the stadium the way we found it afterwards. So infrastructure improvements, no, but what we did in Texas was we did a, a really intense campaign of water conservation among all of our fans and all of our staff. Mm -hmm. We had hang, hang tags in the, uh, in the uh, hotels. Uh, we, we had uh, uh, posters and other information up at events with uh, tips on conserving water that had been developed by the Tarrant County Water District in partnership with us. And we circulated those all over the place through social media and, and through uh, the local newspaper in, in Houston Chronicle did a piece about water conservation for fans who are coming into town. Um, and, and, you know, we don't do that in every city, 
but but again, we designed the program based on you know what is it that this city you know says they really need, and is there something we can do about it? Yeah. Also, I think we, what we've been seeing more and more is we're doing water filling stations instead of individual water bottles. That's become a more common thing in our events, and also our teams because they're in the same place, they're in the same stadium, they're doing more around water issues um, internally. So we are seeing more and more of that. I, I wanted to real quickly see if I can boil down 30 years of experience into about two minutes to give those tips and tricks on uh, hosting yeah, a, yeah. a sustainable well, event. <laughs> so I'll do my best here. Um, I think first I would advise planning early, um, taking a look at what your environmental footprint is, and then maybe at least to start going for the low hanging fruit. So look at things like recycling and what you're doing there, what could be done to enhance those recycling rates, maybe have a, a team in the stadium or wherever your event is to help facilitate that, help fans, um, maybe engage fans by rewarding them with something to get them to recycle. Um, definitely look at, at food waste um, and look at opportunities to either compost that or if it's prepared but unserved, uh, get in touch with your food bank early. Food banks are very well versed in, in picking things up, both prepared and um, you know, packaged products. So I, th I think food recovery is also very, very important. Um, mature recovery, I think you're gonna know in advance what you may have left over afterwards. And very often there are nonprofits in your area that can use it. Um, so, I mean, think about folks like Salvation Army or um, Habitat for Humanity or local schools who may be able to use some of the stuff that's left over afterwards. And, and then I think maybe find some way to make it fun for people to engage around sustainability. Um, we've seen, I know Penn State had like a slingshot game they set up um, at tailgate where people could use a slingshot and try and get their aluminum can into a bin and then they got a prize for, for participating. Um, so I think there's a lot of fun ways to engage fans around that. Um, and, and then I think maybe look if, um, if you've got that low hanging fruit taken care of and you've looked at those basic things, you know, food, material, recycling, um, water use, things like that. Plastics, if you can reduce those, you certainly do. Um, I, I think then look at something that has a social impact. Um, you know, maybe if, if, you're, if you're hosting a football game, have your fans bring books and donate those to local school. Um, you know, there's lots of easy ways to, to engage fans and have a good impact in your community. Yeah, what, one one trick that I want to mention too that that uh, th that we've seen used. Uh, we we haven't used it specifically, mm -hmm. but but we kind of patterned recycle and win after a program that was being done at. Uh, uh, no, uh, I can't remember one of the concert. Uh, you? Somebody help me. What's the big concert? Is it Lollapalooza? That's one of them. Rock okay. in Rio. Uh, huh? Rock in Rio in Brazil. <laughs> Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm not as familiar with that one, Cassie. I'm sorry, but uh, but the uh, uh, I believe it's the Lollapalooza concert uh, series. Um, C3 Productions uh, runs that, and and you know, back to Karen's question before. God, we steal ideas from everybody in the world because we know they're going to steal them from us, and 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 more power to them. But one of the things that they've done is, in terms of recycling, how do you take recycling? You know, recycle and win turns recycling into a real fun, exciting. You know. Uh, story for people. Um, what, uh, what what these guys have done is they set up a great big uh, kiosk in the middle of the uh, uh, event, and um, they they hand out uh, bags to folks, and they say if you fill up the bag and bring the bag completely full with recyclables, we'll give you a concert T-shirt. You know, so if it's a Stones concert, you get a Rolling Stones T-shirt. If it's a if it's a uh, uh, w you know whatever. I don't. That's my. That's the only band I know. So uh, they'll <laughs> they'll hand you a uh, hand you a T-shirt and. Uh, and, and it's amazing because there's no recyclables in the trash bin because everybody wants a t-shirt from the concert. So, so the, the, you know, and that works on any size event, those kinds of tricks. And I think the biggest thing, you know, everything that Susan mentioned makes a lot of sense. There's two things though, creativity, you know, just sitting and brainstorming crazy ideas until you come up with stuff that, that works. And if it doesn't work, try it anyway and, and then do it differently next time. But the other thing, there's three things that I would say, partnerships, partnerships, mm -hmm and partnerships, yeah. you know, find out who else is interested in the same things that you are in that community that's hosting whatever size event it is and say, what do you think about this? Bring those folks to the table and talk about it because none of us is, is, is as smart as all of us. Mm -hmm. I've heard that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. good one. Thank you. Um, so two last questions here, and I, I think you sort of answered one part of one of them. Uh, somebody who's not too familiar with NFL was asking, is the host city decided prior to the season, which we know it is, but um, 
how, do you plan your sustainability events based on the host city um, well ahead or do you do it you know once it, you're there we're, we're, we start about 18 months out um, so before we've even hosted the next Super Bowl, we're already in the community of the, the one that's going, coming up next. And we're talking to folks there and learning about their needs and, and what's happening there, what the big issues are. So yeah, it's about an 18 month before uh, process. And, and then also we're, we're roughly in touch with, I mean, we're in touch once in a while with the folks that are a couple years out. Nice. We, we know about four or five years in advance where Super Bowl is going to be uh, because the bids are awarded on a rotating basis several years in advance because Super Bowl is so big and, and, and it's hard for us to capture the size of, of, of what it's like in a community. If, if there's ever a Super Bowl in any community anywhere near where you live, you know, it doesn't matter if you have tickets for the game, forget about the game. Um, but, but, you know, try and get in there at some point just to see the amazing scope of what this does in a community. The game is merely the tip of the iceberg. Uh, everything else is just enormous in that mm -hmm. city, the events and the games and all, uh, you, you know, all the kind of stuff that goes on. So the, the it does take that- it's Like city. a football Olympics. Exactly. It, and it, just like with the Olympics, it takes a community years to raise the money, to gear up, to sometimes rebuild some of their infrastructure, rebuild their public transportation mm -hmm. sometimes. Mm -hmm. uh, that may be part of the bid process for them. Um, so right now, uh, this past one was Miami, next one is Tampa, then we go to Phoenix, then we go to, uh, Los Angeles. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, we go to, uh, blah, blah, blah. We go to Tampa, then we go to Los Angeles, then we go to Phoenix, then we go to New Orleans. So we already know where we're going for the next uh, uh, couple of years. So finally, to wrap up, is there a holy grail project that you both would love to see the NFL pursue? Hmm. Well, you, you, you know, um, I don't know if it's the Holy Grail. It might be a Holy Grail, um, but um, uh, no, not the Monty Python Holy Grail, but a different, <laughs> different Holy Grail. Um, right now, we're working on a project to bring our, our teams mm -hmm. into the fold, to make this a, a, a league-wide initiative. Uh, it's interesting to note that 28 years ago, we were brought in as part of special events, not as part of community affairs or PR or these other. We were brought in as part of operations. This is a really different model from most sustainability folks that you're going to find in the corporate world, even in the sports world. Many of them, this, this task gets shunted over to, oh, let's let the PR guys handle that, or, or let, let's let the, uh, uh, the community uh, affairs guys handle this, regardless of whether they have any expertise in that area or, or not. We were brought in specifically by special events to work in operations. So all of our stuff originally affected the operations of how the event is run. There was never any thought about how are we going to publicize this? How are we going to promote ourselves? How are we going to look green? Because nobody gave a crap about looking green uh, uh, 28 years ago anyway. It just wasn't a, a big deal for folks. So we were brought in specifically that these environmental principles mean greater efficiency in running our events. And our contention was yes. This is a more efficient way to run your business model. And, and that was the, 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 the uh, umbrella under which we were, we were hired, was this idea of greater efficiency. Mm -hmm. So we, um, um, we oh, yeah. the, my train of thought just left without me, sorry. <laughs> so I think my holy grail uh, for oh, this would grail. not be, yes, <laughs> there you go, oh, with that. Grail. I was thinking of Monty um, Python. I, mean, I love the, the bigger projects we're doing right now. That we're, we're bringing in really diverse groups. We're bringing in uh, environmental protection groups and, and veterans and scientists and universities, and we're working together to tackle some of the bigger issues around climate change and sustainability. I love that model. And I think we're gonna see more and more of that going forward. I hope we do. I hope we can influence other teams and leagues to do the same thing, to bring together these diverse groups, to work together on these huge problems, to try and address them. Because the interest is there, the will is there. It's a matter of pooling resources so things can get done. So that would be one part of it, continuing to work on things like that. But then also using the, you know, the power of the shield to, get more people involved in sustainability. We're talking to the folks in London, we're talking to the United Nations. You know, they're interested because we use the power of sports to get the word out about environmental issues. And, and I think um, to have that continue and grow and leverage that to get more people to buy into this and pay attention and realize they're gonna have to all work together to address things like climate change. Um, I think that's the big one for me. Yeah, and uh, by the way, the, the uh, NFL is a signatory to the UNFCCC uh, Sport and Sustainability mm -hmm. uh, Framework. Uh, which just happened this past um, th this this past year. Uh, the NBA, I believe, is also a signatory. Uh, Major League Baseball is in the process 
Uh, they got a little bit derailed. They got some bigger problems they're trying to deal with right now. But but th their intention is to sign on to the UNFCCC as well uh, on, on climate change and support. And um, NHL the, is getting there too. Well, yeah, the, 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 the NHL, NHL had, had decided not to sign on. Um, and then uh, we, we called our buddy over at NHL and we said, hey, guess what? We're signing and NBA is signing and Major League Baseball is signing. You guys have fun looking from outside. You have fun looking in the window from outside. You know, we'll, we'll remember you when we're making all the decisions. And yeah. they said, oh, crap, we better join. And I yeah. said, hey, you know, up, up, up to you guys, but you want to be the only ones left out, left out. We joined for two reasons. Number one, because we, we think it's, it's necessary. And we already talked about the impact of sport on, on the public uh, agenda and, and what the potential is for that. But there's a second reason, too. There's, uh, I, I believe there's more than 150 sports uh, organizations and sports-related organizations that have now signed on to that sports sustainability framework. These folks are going to be meeting. In fact, we were supposed to be meeting with them in, uh, in, in London in March, uh, it, it, but uh, they, they will be meeting and discussing issues. They're going to be coming up with frameworks, with ideas, with concepts around uh, sustainability, uh, with, with suggestions and other stuff. We don't want to be left out of that. We, we don't want the American sports world uh, to be an outsider and to be sitting and looking at this and, and wondering where it's going to go. We want to have an impact on that agenda. We want to make sure that our agenda and the way that we approach sustainability is represented somehow in those um, in, in those conversations. Mm -hmm. uh, that's really important to us to be a part of that uh, going forward. Yeah, and I think also to share best practices because we still get calls from teams and leagues saying, "Okay, we we know what you guys are doing, but how do you do it?" Yeah. And if we can walk them through it, and then they can do it, uh, I think the impact there can be tremendous. Yeah, we 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 have met. Uh, we have a series of games in London, which unfortunately have been canceled for this year, but we have a series of games in London and at the uh, London games, we've gone and met with the folks at Wembley Stadium and at Tottenham and, uh, and with our, our NFL uh, United Kingdom uh, branch over there as well too. And we've talked to them. There are some things they do extremely well and, and we're learning new things mm -hmm. from uh, the folks at Wembley Stadium and from um, the, uh, um, from uh, the British FA Football Association. Um, there are other things that they have very little experience with and we were able to sit down and meet with, uh, with, with a large number of their folks uh, and, and walk them through some of the things that we've done. For instance, sponsor, engaging sponsors around sustainability is kind of a new concept to, to them uh, where you know, bringing all their departments together with a series of monthly and, and, and semi-annual uh, objectives, uh, that's a new concept to us. And, and, and they're teaching us about that. So we think there's, there's, there's a, a lot of stuff that's going to be exchanged um, back and forth. Yes, uh, Jack and Susan, thanks for this awesome talk. Personally, it was a dream to have you both here today. I told Jack before. And I want to say for you that was um, amazing. And thank you very much for making the world a better place to live. I want to pass now to Andrew, our, our president, to close the event. Uh, thanks again, uh, Jack and Susan, for coming in today uh, and talking to us about sustainability and, and what the NFL is doing. Um, as a born and raised Lions fan, sometimes the NFL causes me a lot of pain, but this is <laughs> good to hear about all of the ways that um, the NFL is using their influence and impact to, uh, to make the world a better place through uh, sustainable actions. Um, so we really appreciate you taking the time out of your day and for spending some extra time with us to answer um, some good questions, some really interesting questions, and then to hear about uh, what you're doing in sustainability and to learn some lessons from you and uh, I know we'll take some some lessons about what you've uh, things you've talked about and then try to apply that to some of our things and help to spread that um, as far as we can so thank you again oh, thank you it was, it was a pleasure and thank you guys for the good work you're doing keep going you guys are the future you're the ones that are going to save the world so keep going <laughs> and I will be rooting for you from that beach chair in Barcelona someday <laughs> sounds good uh, so thanks again. At this time, we're going to wrap up um, and close down. Um, and I think we do have the video for this, so we may be able to make that available online. We'll we'll make sure that we clear that with Jack and Susan. But um, yeah, so we're going to close up at this time. That's thanks good. everyone for joining us. Thank you. Thanks so much. Bye everyone. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.